Hello, my name is Grand Paws. I'm a judge and organizer for the My Little Pony collectible card game, and you are listening to the MBS Show. Hello and welcome to the MBS Show, episode number 122. I'm your host, Tom Sanzo. Joining me today is Rom. Hello, all you happy people. Hey, Rom, how are you doing, man? Slowly but surely, thank you for asking. Hmm, so, did nothing today? No shopping, no nothing? I had done nothing but watch the same video for three hours. What video is that? You don't want to know. Oh, God. Wait, you didn't go out to the place I showed you online where you can get the Magic the Gathering cards? It's the weekend. The shop's closed. That sucks. Oh, well, this is a village. What do you expect? Uh, I don't know. Half day open, maybe? Nah, it doesn't work that way. Uh, it's either all day or no day. <laughs> oh, okay. I, 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 I can respect that principle. All right. But you're missing out on something. And talking about Magic the Gathering and card games, uh, our guest for this week is also a card gamer. But not any card gamer. It's the My Little Pony collectible card game. And our guest for this week is Grand Paws. Hello. Hey there, GP. GP is easier. Yeah, GP sounds cool. Yeah. Yeah, GP is fine. <laughs> I am totally fine with GP. How are you? I'm doing fine, man. I'm doing fine. So, GP, how are you today, man? Uh, since yesterday was the 4th of July, a lot of loud noises. Oh, yeah, but not too bad here. Uh, stayed up plenty late and got very little sleep, too excited, but it's I'm doing very well, thank you. Yay! I'm glad you're excited, because I am excited. I up a few times in trying to introduce you. <laughs> That's all right. Yay! So, anywho, GP, um, before we officially start, I need to ask you the four important questions. And question number one is... What's your favorite character? Ooh, Fluttershy is definitely best pony. Yes. So why Fluttershy? Fluttershy, I think, has uh, some very interesting character. Uh, I don't know if you'd necessarily call them flaws, but just uh, her character has uh, opportunity to grow in the show. And a lot of people who I know think uh, that Fluttershy... A, a lot of people who I know that think that Fluttershy is uh, one of the better characters often do so because they identify with her. They think, oh, she's very shy, she's very timid, she's afraid in front of uh, large crowds and things like that. I am too. That's not the case with me. I'm actually an extreme extrovert. I love being out there in the limelight and with people. But yet I still recognize Fluttershy as being very well written for the struggles that she has. And more than that, I think uh, she's the most one of the most mature that's uh, detailed in the show. Uh, she lives on her own. She's self-sufficient. She takes care of a wide variety of animals and her wisdom and insight into uh, various problems, um, especially, you know, when it comes to discord, of course, is um, head and hooves above what anyone else uh, has put forth. Mm, okay, well, there, there's a good way to explain it. You did it better than what I could have said. I would just say she's cute. <laughs> Well, she is cute. Uh, true that, true that. So, favorite episode? Ooh. That's tricky. I mean, the season four finale was definitely really, really fun to see how far this show has come uh, to where we can basically have Dragon Ball Z fight scenes going on in it. Uh, but if we're talking just my favorite episode, I would probably have to go with... Either Sleepless in Ponyville, which I love for the development between Rainbow Dash and Scootaloo, and then also seeing uh, Luna's role as uh, watching over uh, dreams. Or I really, really like Suited for Success. <laughs> and I know that you just recently had another guest on the show whose favorite episode probably also happens to be Suited for Success and whose favorite pony also happens to be Fluttershy. And I swear... That mine was in no way, shape, or form influenced by Silver's opinion. Hmm. I got no idea what you're talking about. Hmm. I know, I know, I know. No, purely purely original. Here. Hmm, yeah, yeah, totally original, totally original. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's cool, that's cool. So, uh, how did you become a fan of the show? Oh, that's a funny story. Hmm. Um like many other people, uh, I first saw it through the memes that were spreading around on the internet, the little images and uh, things like that all over various boards. And I had never 
had an, an interest in this. I know that my aunt had uh, played with the toys when she was younger. My aunt's uh, 10 years older than me, so she was right there at the perfect age for the original, uh, you know, Generation 1. Um, but I, I didn't know. So one day I was just very, very bored. I sat down and I said, okay, everyone keeps talking about this. Let's see what it's all about. And I uh, went and loaded up the first episode I could find from the new show. It was not the, f- it was not the first episode of season one. It was about halfway through season one. It was either uh, Suited for Success, could have been uh, Sonic Rainboom, something right around that, that time. And I watched it and I said, hey, that was pretty clever, you know, and the music was good in it. And I, I really like the music in the show, not just the songs, but the background music as well. And so I said, okay, well, let's watch another one. And that section of season one has like five or six great back-to-back episodes. So you've got Green Isn't Your Color, you've got Sonic Rainbow, you've got Cutie Mark Chronicles, you've got just all of these that are right there. And so at that point, I was, I said, yeah, this is a great show. Let's get some more. Watch mm-hmm. the whole season, and then realized we were in the hiatus between season one <laughs> and season two. Oh, oh my. The hiatus. But with the return of season two, with John Delancey playing Discord, uh, of which I got to be part of all the hype building up to that <laughs> and seeing it spoiled as well, that was definitely really, really great. And that, at that point, I was hooked. Awesome, awesome. I mean, you came in at a great time. I think I was... In the same timeline as you were, I came in about halfway through and suffered the first hiatus round. And, mm-hmm. well, I wasn't too worried but back then because I wasn't that, how, how do I put this? I wasn't that involved in the fandom as per, uh, sure. per se. Sure. But, I don't know, I mean, ooh, just getting to season two was awesome and, oh, it was so good, so good. The fandom, the fandom really kept the uh, fandom alive. It's true. It was funny. Uh, I began to see what was coming out of the fandom uh, just before uh, Season 2 uh, picked off. So I discovered Equestria Daily uh, not more than, I'd say, two months before Season 2 launched. So I I didn't have a whole lot of an idea of what was out there for the fandom. And as time goes by and I begin looking in more and more places and seeing more and more artists and attending cons and working with the card game and meeting developers and meeting other fans of the show, I'm truly amazed at the quality of work that people in this fandom can put out. It surpasses anything else I've seen. It's unbelievable. So that's a big shout out to every brony everywhere who contributes in any way, shape or form to this fandom. You are awesome. Thumbs up. That's true. That's true. And the last question is, what do your family and friends think about your love for the show? Uh, I may be one of the few cases where my family and friends are aware of my love for the show, if for no other reason, because all the management of the card game itself means I often have to post on Facebook. And a lot of the groups related to the My Little Pony collectible card game are very public groups, so everyone kind of sees. Uh, <laughs> but they, they have no issue with it. You know, I, I sat there, I explained to uh, my folks the last time I saw them what I was doing, why I liked the game, what the purpose of the game was, and, you know, why I like the show. And while they may not have been interested or even understood themselves, they at least recognized that it was perfectly healthy and totally fine. And I couldn't ask for better parents in that regard. Awesome. That's awesome. And your friends? Uh, my, my friends can be evenly split on it. They all enjoy uh, giving me crap for it from time to time, of course, uh, and and heckling me. But yet I've uh, semi-converted a few of them. Uh, <laughs> I've got one friend who I know is like he he uh, phrases it as he's brony light, uh, <laughs> <laughs> which I liked. Uh, all the calorie or all the taste of full brony now with zero calories. Uh, <laughs> but he and I will often sit there on a, uh, a Friday and use the, uh, the web stream. I don't know if you've seen it, BerryTube before. No, I haven't heard of that one. That's new for me. Uh, BerryTube is very, very fun, but it's, it's a, uh, a game involving, uh, streamed episodes of, uh, the show, uh, intermixed with fan videos and songs hmm. and things like that. And it's a drinking game. Okay. So, <laughs> oh, okay. 
So it's very, very fun on Friday when we have nothing better to do than to sit there and watch ponies and drink beer and just have a good time. So. Mm, all right, all right, all right. So well, my friends, my friends enjoy it. Sounds like a fun time. Mm. <laughs> all righty then. And thanks for answering the four basic questions there, um, GP. So um, sure, no problem. Moving on next is well, news time and Rom. It's your time. I am Robbie Walt, and this is News Time on the NBA Show. In today's News Time, Larry's comic shows off their 22nd issue of My Little Pony. We all love the My Little Pony comics, and we love the variant cover that they have. We also love it when they do a parody cover. Recently, Larry's Comics announced the variant cover for the 22nd issue of My Little Pony comics. The cover is a homage to the Incredible Hulk comic. Links can be found in the show notes below. So, who here have seen the Incredible Hulk cover? Because... That's a eerie similarity. I'm, a, mm, I'm looking at it right now. Yep, it's pretty funny to see the side by side comparison. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know. I love this kind of covers where they parody this kind of cover. <laughs> they already you love did the kind several of cover. parodies, didn't they? Hmm? They already did oh, quite yeah. a few parodies in the past, right? Yep, 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 yep. Um, they did one with uh, the background crew and it resembles one of the Justice League comic uh, I forgot <laughs> what's the title called but uh, it's something like that it shows DJ Poom Tree and the Doctor and whatever else looking at the audience and saying um, what of it something I don't, I don't really remember it's fun seeing these comic artists being able to uh, make reference to uh, other other uh, forms of the same media out there, uh, these other famous superhero comics. And now that uh, My Little Pony is outselling both Marvel and DC uh, as the best-selling comic book series right now, that's pretty impressive. Yeah, that, that is true, that is true. But wait until they have to reboot the universe and then things will go down the drain. Oh, boy. <laughs> we'll be lucky if Celestia and Luna survive that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Soon. You never know. Soon we'll see what will happen to Twilight Sparkle and her wings. Probably she'll just become another alicorn, or maybe just a pony, or normal of pony. Who knows? Ooh. Double alicorn. <laughs> oh my. Maybe the transformation messes up and she just gets a second horn instead. <laughs> oh my. I, I got the... Personally, I think it'll be like in Dragon Balls. There'll be a alicorn fusion ability. Oh. Oh, if they manage to give her all her... If all the princesses manage to give her power... I have this feeling that there could be an ability to like combine everything, matter and energy. Uh, I, I could see that. She'd become enormously tall, taller <laughs> than all the buildings in Ponyville, because obviously that's been part of the Alicorn transformation. Walking around with four horns and eight wings. Look uh, like something look like something out of the old testament. <laughs> oh my. Anyway, we with that, let's move on to the next news. And another news. Rupert Grant spotted wearing a brony t shirt. It looks like Rupert Grint, is, did I pronounce his name right? Please tell me I did. I yes, guess did. so, yeah. Okie dokie. It looks like Rupert Grint, Ron Aisley from Harry Potter, has been rocking a brony shirt. The pictures that could be found online are real and not have been doctored. Does this mean he is a brony? Probably. But it's nice to see a celebrity rocking a nice looking shirt. It was nice that he was able to wear that and have fun with it. Yep, yep. I, I, here's the thing with um, celebrities wearing brony shirts and whatnot. Like, I mean, pony shirts in general, does this mean they're a brony? Who knows? Does this mean they're a fan of the show? Who knows? Because celebrities, they like to troll their fans sometimes. And oh, sure. Yeah, who knows? It would be nice if he is a fan. One more to the fandom pool, but yeah, who knows? He's kind of at that age where he could he could fall in with the older brony crowd though. Mm, so true, true. I wouldn't I wouldn't put it past him. Mm, true, and the show is good. Essentially the show is good. So him as an actor looking at the show as an actor point of view, he might like it from that point. Who knows? That's true. That's true. He obviously needs to guest star on the show oh, as yeah. Star Swirl. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> mm, I like it, but you, <coughs> you mad, Harry? <laughs> but he needs to have an older voice for it. Like he's too young. He needs to have a gravelly voice. I think he's older than me, and I think I'm older than you. <laughs> I don't know about that. But any. I'm sorry, sorry. I should do that in the right voice. Um, 
I'm a year older than you. <laughs> <laughs> oh my! Oh, but anywho, anywho, oh, yeah, um, that's great of you, Rupert. But keep on wearing the brony shirt. Somebody go get him a Luna or Fluttershy. That's more awesome. <laughs> Agreed. Indeed. I am Robald, and this has been News Time with a Mail Show. Back to you, Norm. Yay! Thank you, Rom. And well, let's move on to the next topic. And the next topic is guest time. And in today's guest time, we have Grand Paws. And like I said earlier, he's an expert on the My Little Pony trading up uh, on the My Little Pony collectible card game. Yeah, correct. Trading collectible card game. They're both effectively the same thing, but the official name is the collectible card game. Yep. So, how are you doing, man? Having fun yet? I am. I'm having a good time. Awesome, awesome. So, first question is, how did you got started in this? Because the card game, when I first saw it, it's like, what is this? Why is this so complicated? <laughs> uh, that's that's a funny uh, that's a funny question. Um, when I heard about the collectible card game, it was still in development. Uh, there was news last year around uh, the end of the summer, uh, beginning of the fall. And at that point, I was actually studying abroad in Nagasaki, Japan for a while, so I didn't have the opportunity to participate in the card game right when it released here in the United States later that year. Um, mm-hmm. While I was reading about that news, I had been working at a uh, local uh, game store. Not just card games, but other types of uh, board games and uh, miniature games and role-playing games. So your, your friendly local game store environment. But we yeah. also did uh, Magic the Gathering at the time. And I uh, encouraged my boss to pick up some of this product when it came out. Um, I went looking for news because I had played Magic and other collectible card games before, and so I was very interested to see how the My Little Pony game was going to go. So I signed on uh, to be a volunteer uh, for this game because I knew that while we already had plenty of Magic judges in the area, there weren't really that many people who would want to champion this card game, so to speak. And I knew that that was something I would be very capable of doing. So I went on and signed up uh, through a form that I think we're going to provide all our listeners with a link to today Mm -hmm. and sat and waited and waited and waited. And uh, nothing was really coming at first, and that was okay, because I figured the game would probably have a slow start for a while. But when I got back to the U.S., uh, my friend had picked up the two-player starter set for me with Fluttershy and with uh, Pinkie Pie. Mm -hmm. And so naturally, I chose Best Pony and (laughs) went with Fluttershy for my deck um, and had a lot of fun with it. The rules were... Uh, relatively easy to understand if you've played a collectible card game before. It is a very different feel for a game, though. So even though having knowledge of other card games will help you in this one, the play style is very, very different. And so that's what I appreciated. It was kind of a new challenge. So we sat there and we played for a while, and I uh, went back and started organizing events for this at my store, where I uh, resumed working. And it was in April... Uh, that I noticed that um, there was a, uh, an announcement that went out to people who had filled out that volunteer form saying, hey, we need people for this convention up in the Bay Area near San Francisco called BabsCon. Uh, and this went out about a week before BabsCon. <laughs> so I said, oh, they, they probably need some people if they're asking this this close to the actual date. So I said, I would be happy to do this. Uh, I went up and... Uh, said, you know, I am I am here at this con uh, to work with Enterplay and to organize events for the card game. I had always told myself, even though I was a fan of the show, even though I enjoyed listening to music and watching, you know, videos and looking at art and, you know, reviewing episodes and all of that, I would never be caught dead at a brony con. Mm. It's always what I told myself. I went there and had the most fun I think I have had with this fandom ever. So for anyone who doubts the fun that you can have at a brony themed convention, you need to go. It's really, really fun. Yay. Well, at least you're not at BronyCon. You were at BabsCon, so you didn't break your own rule. 
That's that's very very true. And Babscon was actually a huge success. So uh, enormous uh, props to them for getting a first year con to be so successful that even Tara Strong says this is the best first year con I've ever been to. So it was very well run. Yeah, yeah. While I was there at uh, Babscon, I worked with a couple individuals. Uh, one from an online uh, card retailer who has connections with Enterplay, and then a man by the name of Trevor. And uh, Trevor is a uh, lead developer. Uh, for the My Little Pony collectible card game. So he's actually been very influential in uh, how the game has developed and how the cards are created and the uh, themes and the mechanics that end up going into this. So I worked with him uh, at a volunteer booth uh, selling Interplay products, but also organizing the tournaments that they had for the collectible card game there. And since I had uh, been very familiar with the comprehensive rules, the tournament-level rules for the game, and uh, read through that and had a pretty good understanding of it, I ended up being the head judge for that event, um, uh, organizing players and answering rules questions and getting everything situated. So my first real organized event, apart from the small tournaments at the store, had about 70 players in it, wow. and it was an amazing experience. Uh, that's cool. I mean, 70 players for an up-and-coming card game? That's cool. It was really, really neat. And by that time, you realized the card game had been out for less than six months. So to see that many players in the Bay Area playing was incredible. And I really appreciate everyone who came out to that to make it such a huge success. Mm. At the end of the weekend, I had made uh, great connections with the two individuals that I had worked with and uh, continued to keep in contact with them through uh, Facebook and through other uh, forms of communication and plan on continuing to volunteer for uh, other upcoming conventions very, very soon. Oh, awesome, awesome, awesome. I've played the game, and to be honest, when, when I first played the game with a guy who owns a card shop, but when we played it, it was very, it was a hard game to pick up because, I don't know, I mean, he plays um, Magic, White Schwartz, Vanguard, and Pokemon. And I played almost a similar game as he does. And picking this game up, it's kind of hard. Like the system and playstyle, it's a bit hard. When and when I brought this game to my other Brony friends during the second anniversary of the MBS show, and we played with them, we had fun. But picking it up and teaching it to others with limited knowledge, it's a bit hard. So. How would you teach someone who doesn't really know and doesn't really have a avenue for finding how to play this game properly? That's a good question. The card game is definitely different than what you see with other collectible card games out there, in that uh, with a game like Magic or a game like Yu-Gi-Oh! or any sort of game uh, where it's uh, direct conflict between the two players, uh, you're going to have a lot of effects that are going to be uh, destroying or removing your opponent's creatures, which are kept there on the field. Uh, and obviously, uh, that wouldn't really fit the theme of My Little Pony with, you know, some spell that kills your opponent's ponies. and Count the spell. You know, Right, exactly. So that sort of thing isn't what they were going for. The theme, if I were to give a brief uh, description of the uh, card game and how it works, I'll, I'll do it as this. The object of the My Little Pony collectible card game is to use uh, your main character and your main character's friends uh, to solve the problems in Ponyville. And solving problems in Ponyville ends up earning you points, and the first player to reach 15 points wins the game. So the basic layout of how the game functions is players are going to draw cards, they're going to interact with troublemakers their opponents may have played, they're going to play their own cards, and then they're going to check and see if they're meeting the requirements of these problems. Uh, just like in a game like uh, Magic the Gathering, um, the ponies have different colors associated with them, and each color is supposed to represent one of the six elements of harmony. So you'll need certain amounts of certain colors in order to solve a problem. And your opponent is also capable of uh, confronting that same problem. I should be saying confronting is the right term. So you're uh, playing ponies uh, 
which are getting you closer towards meeting the requirements of these problems. You are playing uh, events which are uh, special uh, one-time effects. Uh, you're playing resources which can be everything from a fancy outfit for your pony to wear that makes it you know better at doing one particular thing, or it can be something that uh, makes it more difficult for your opponent to try and solve those problems. And uh, those effects are very, very similar to other card games. Mm. The rule book that is included in the card game is enough to have a basic understanding of how it works. But it does leave a few things blank. And it's great that Bronies already had such a huge online presence because it means that several communities immediately popped up where if people had rules questions or were unclear on how the game worked, they could go there to ask questions. So the two biggest places I would recommend for new players to go to if they have any questions about how the game works or if they want to uh, receive advice on building a deck or things like that is the... uh, uh, the subreddit group, first off, uh, which we'll provide a link to, and then also the My Little Pony CCG Rules Facebook group. Uh, there's all sorts of people on here. Oftentimes, people are shared between these two groups, and you can ask from very, very novice questions to very, very technical questions, and people will be more than happy to provide an answer and argue over it for your amusement. <laughs> awesome, awesome, awesome. And unfortunately, one of our co-hosts here, James, couldn't make it to the interview but he really needed to ask um, some questions, and I nominate Rom to ask them for you. I got this. So, speaking of um, gameplay, how the, how long does a game usually last? Is it easy as picking it up and playing it, or does it require a long t- a lot of time to set it up? It's relatively minimal setup, as most uh, card games are going to be. Um, if you get a card game out of the box, oftentimes you'll have some sort of a mat that's included with it to show you where to play certain types of cards. And that goes not just for the My Little Pony collectible card game, but for other card games as well. Uh, however, it's not needed to play. Once you learn the basic location where you should be playing most of your cards on the table... It's very, very easy. So the only thing that's needed to actually get a game going is for each player to obviously have their decks ready, uh, to select the starting problem, uh, shuffle the remainder of both of your decks, and draw your hand. Uh, Depending on which decks are being played, a game can be very, very short, um, about five minutes or so, especially if the players are very experienced in how the rules work and understand what their opponent's cards do. Or... Yeah, if the players are playing more of a uh, control style, kind of making the game last a little bit longer and making things more difficult for their opponents rather than just trying to rush and score points themselves, it can last upwards of 30 minutes. 30 minutes is the time limit that Interplay has chosen for organized uh, competitive play, but for casual play, you can do whatever you want. Hmm, okay. Interesting. And is there any game strategy that's a game breaker, like a card that is way too overpowered or a combination of cards that makes the game unbalanced? You know, people are always going to uh, complain about cards that hurt their personal favorite strategies. So you go to, you know, something like Friday Night Magic at a a local card store and someone will come up to the front counter and say, oh, I just got crushed by this deck. Obviously, this deck is way too strong. Why did they print these cards? And then you'll have the next person come up who will say the exact same thing about the person's deck who just went up there and complained in the first place. So... A lot of that is subjective. A lot of people are just going to be sitting there complaining about a strategy that hurts their own uh, favorite. Um, I think that because the My Little Pony collectible card game was created and designed and developed by people who have had experience with collectible card games before, it does a good job of keeping things balanced. These are not people who uh, have never worked in game design before. Um, and I'll go into that here a little bit after I answer your question. There are some cards in the game which are very, very powerful, especially with combined with other cards. Um, but nearly every threat in the game has a possible answer to it. It's just a matter of whether or not your opponent has it in their hand at that point in time. So examples of this, uh, one 
effect that I see a lot of players complain about is a card called Fluttershy Guidance Counselor. Mm -hmm. And it's not just because I'm partial to Fluttershy. Uh, This card is very, very strong. It reduces your opponent's resource. It reduces your opponent's action tokens gained every turn. And this can be very, very challenging if you are forcing your opponent to discard cards from their hand as well through uh, a Troublemaker, which we'll get the chance to go into later, uh, because it means that they're running out of options in their hands, and they're not getting the resources they need to play the cards in their hand, so it becomes uh, very debilitating. And a lot of people say Flutter, uh, Fluttershy Guidance Counselor, or the shortened version is Flutter Guy, which is pretty fun. Um uh, is overpowered. And it's not, because there's ways to deal with it. Uh, it's just a matter of whether or not you're playing it. Mm-hmm. Now, there are some cards and certain effects in the game that at this point in time are probably a little too strong. And that's not due to those effects themselves being too strong. It's due to having a limited card base. We only have two sets for the collectible card game right now. We've got the Premier set, which came out last year, and we have Canterlot Knights, which came out in April or May of this year. So it's very, very new. Mm-hmm. And so there's a deck that exists right now that is, uh, for players who are familiar with collectible card games, you'll know what a combo deck is. Combo decks are decks that oftentimes aren't going to have a lot of interaction with the opponent's play. They're going to focus on their own thing. It's almost like playing solitaire. And once you get the necessary cards that you need, you start your combo and you start going off. And at that point, your opponent can pretty much do nothing but sit there and watch and hope that you screw up somehow. Mm-hmm. Um, the difficulty is we only have two sets. So even though one pace, uh, this, this combo deck, is very, very strong at the moment um, and could be disrupted, we don't have the tools to do so yet. I expect them to be printed in the mm-hmm. future. You know, this reminds me of uh, the card game called Card Fight Vanguard. And essentially, the card game has been going on for almost four to five years now and they run into this one problem where it's a bad habit from Bushiro where they keep restarting the game with every new season of the anime they add in new skills they add in new effects and whatnot and essentially the game like you told me before is kind of a very rush down beat em up kind of game where right uh, like a, a blitz style right mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and I don't mind that kind of play style, but the problem in terms of marketing on their side is each time something new comes up, we are for- we are not really forcing you to get it, but if you want to be the best, you must get it. Right, right. Yeah. It's that, it's not necessary, but it's necessary yeah. type thing. Yeah. And, right. and that's it, it's frustrating, but I can understand why. When you're making a card game based off of an anime about that card game being played, The closer you can follow the show, the better. I know that was always really aggravating for me and my friends when we were kids was, Mm -hmm. you know, watching Yu-Gi-Oh! or something along those lines and then saying, this is nothing like the card game. (laughs) This isn't even close. What are they doing? They're breaking all the rules. (laughs) As Kaiba always says, screw the rule, I have money. (laughs) That's exactly right. So, uh, that was... That was something that was frustrating. So I can at least appreciate the fact that they're trying to keep the game as close to the anime as possible, but it does make it frustrating for new players, or for existing players even, Mm -hmm. uh, to come in and say, well, all these rules that I built my deck around are now effectively worthless. Not really. really. In Vanguard, it's not really worthless, but in terms of if you want to win, it's, nah, go get something new. And I, I need to ask this one. In terms of a certain set cards um, in Vanguard you have certain clans and those clans work well with wh- whatever and sure. in tournament you always see certain clans go to the top like the Kagero clan for example and also in Yu-Gi-Oh you have certain clans that or certain cards that goes to the top and everyone copies that set even if they do a minor tweak and whatnot. So sure. do you see that in ponies? Absolutely. I mean, net decking, which is basically what you're talking about, where someone builds a popular deck, and then everyone says, 
oh, this is a really strong deck, I'm going to build this and I'm going to hop on board the train while it's while it's still going, mm-hmm. is something that's going to happen in any collectible card game because a lot of people simply don't have the time necessary to sit research. there and mm-hmm. come up with, right, and, and research and come up with all the strategy on their own. And you think about the groups that are coming up with these with these decks and testing them and deciding that, yes, this is the best strategy because these cards work in this particular way with each other. I mean, these are not just individuals. More often than not, these are groups of uh, players who are getting together and really think tanking and saying, okay, let's see what we can do. Uh, and it's it's both healthy and non-healthy. Mm-hmm. It's healthy because it encourages uh, a, a higher level of thinking about the game. It's not just, I'm going to put together a bunch of pretty cards and throw them into a deck. Mm-hmm. It's really coming up with some interesting strategy. But at the same time, if those decks that are being created are so powerful that no one else can ever beat them, uh, and that's due to the decks being, you know, just the cards in the decks being too strong and not balanced with other cards in the same set, mm-hmm. then that's an issue. Mm-hmm. And thankfully, like I said, the collectible card game, the My Little Pony collectible card game, doesn't really experience that right now, uh, and I don't expect it to in the future. I find it very interesting that uh, Hasbro chose to have Enterplay do the card game, and this is something I don't think I've spoken about before. So for players here who aren't aware, uh, Hasbro is a big company. Hasbro's a really big company. They own a lot of uh, smaller uh, subsidiaries, and one of those is called Wizards of the Coast, who you Mm -hmm. may be familiar with. And for those of you who are not, Wizards of the Coast uh, owns several major franchises. If you're familiar with the Dungeons & Dragons franchise, that's Wizards of the Coast. If you're familiar with Kaijudo, which is another collectible card game, that's one. And I think some of you may have heard of a card game called Magic the Gathering, the Mm. one that kind of started it all. I never heard of that one. I, I don't believe you. I don't believe you for a second. <laughs> but it's been around for 20 years now. It came out in 1993, 1994. Uh, and Hasbro owns Wizards of the Coast, who owns the intellectual property of um, uh, Magic the Gathering. So to have the idea to make a My Little Pony collectible card game and to not go with Wizards of the Coast, who already had experience making a successful one, was a very interesting decision. Mm. Instead, they went with Enterplay. And for any of you who aren't familiar, Enterplay is a company that previously has never made a game before in their entire lives. Enterplay, uh, to the best of my knowledge, I hope that's not wrong, um, but I believe that Enterplay has only focused on uh, trading cards. Yeah, trading cards, yeah, yeah. Right, exactly. So they do do the uh, collectible uh, cards, uh, just the basic trading cards, not the game. Um, and then Hasbro approached them and said, we'd like you to you know, do the collectible card game as well. And I'm assuming this is because they didn't want something directly competing with Magic the Gathering because they didn't want Wizards making both of those and splitting their time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But because of this, this meant Enterplay had to go out and find people who had been experienced in card game design before. And this allowed them to uh, acquire several individuals who had worked on Magic the Gathering, who had worked on other uh, collectible card games, who had this necessary experience, and to bring them onto that staff. So that's why we see many effects in this game and uh, many interactions that are very, very similar to other trading mm-hmm. card games. I wanted to note that before, where Wizards of the um, Hasbro owns Wizard of the Coast. And Wizard of the Coast deals with Magic the Gathering, one of the largest and most popular card games in the world. Oh, like, by far. Yeah. Like my, my other co-host, James, he plays Magic. And I've checked with Rom. He, his country sells Magic and he lives in Lithuania. So my it's goodness. all over the world. So for them not to ask Wizard to do it, it's mind-blowing to me. It's very strange, but I'm assuming they didn't want Wizards to have to split their effort between three different card games right now. Because even though Kaijudo may not be anywhere near as large as some of the other big card games, it's still something Wizards is continuing to provide support for. And with them spending all their time on Magic right now with the new release of N15, which is coming out here in two weeks, with uh, the release of Cons of Tarkir later this year, mm-hmm. everything they're planning, it's I can understand why they do that. Okay, okay. Right. What, in your opinion, is the best expansion that has been released so far? 
Well, like I was saying, there's only two sets that are out right now for the card game. The card game is very, very new, which means it's a good time for a lot of players to get involved. Um, one of the biggest barriers to entry of something like Magic the Gathering is that the game's been around for 20 years. So unless you're playing the very, very simple formats that are just using the newest cards, that is 20 years of cards that you'll probably need to know many different effects from if you want to be a competitive player. And my brain is just melts when I try to look back at some of these old strategies and see how they work. Um, My Little Pony only has two sets right now. You've got the Premier set, and you've got Canterlot Knights. And they're each different, and they're each important to the card game's current life. Canterlot opened the doors to more interesting play, Um, uh, what we like to call uh, jank, uh, which just means uh, really interesting uh, strategies and effects uh, in the game, Um, Maybe not necessarily the most competitive, but all kinds of fun interactions and things like that that you can do. And Canterlot provides plenty of tools to do that. It does have some good competitive cards as well. Mm. Uh, Premier, though, still provides many of the necessary cards to get, uh, to get a card, uh, or to get a deck working. And this is because, uh, here's a little bit of a, a tidbit on the game for you. Um, when you play cards in the game, uh, you have to spend action tokens in order to play them. Action tokens are those resources that you gain at the start of each of your turns. Um, Some cards are also going to require you to already have uh, ponies that you've played of a particular element, one of the six elements of, uh, or one of the six elements of harmony. Uh, And if you don't already have that particular element on the field in that amount, you can't play that card. Well, Premier uh, introduced uh, many of the ponies who don't have that requirement. You can play them as long as you have the action tokens. They have no color or no element requirement. Mm. Uh, but Canterlot has far more cards that have that requirement, so you already need to have those uh, entry, we call them entry friends, from Premier in order to play them. So to answer your question as to which one is the best expansion, the Premier set still provides a foundation for many, many decks, and there are still some very, very powerful cards in Premier. The most valuable cards are still in Premier. Uh, however, Canterlot really diversified the metagame and allowed a lot of decks that currently exist to function where they couldn't have functioned before. Mm. So basically what you're saying is the Premier is a good step to get into the game by a few, so you get at least you get something to play with. It's not a bad idea. I'd recommend for any player who's looking to get started, the first thing you should buy is a theme deck. You're going to need a theme deck because the theme decks are going to include the main characters that you're going to be playing with. If you're familiar with Magic the Gathering, this is very much like Commander or or EDH, Elder Dragon Highlander, if you've played that format. You have a character who uh, is basically always in play. Uh, you all, You start the game with them. Uh, and the theme decks are nice because they include a lot of those entry friends in the deck's uh, colors with the respective elements. So, for instance, if you play the deck that has either Twilight Sparkle or Applejack as your main character, you're going to have entry friends in purple, and you're going to have entry friends in orange, in addition to a lot of other effects. And if you just go out and buy booster packs right at the beginning, you might not get the friends that you need in the colors that you need. So theme decks are very useful in that regard. Mm. So here's something to the rule. When you play the game, you must have a friend, right? The starting friend or like Twilight or whatever. The starting main character? That's correct. You must have it. Mm -hmm. So basically you need to buy at least one of the starter decks out there just to have a game. That's correct, and that's very different from a lot of other card games, where you can go and buy the starter deck, but the starter deck isn't really necessary. It's usually just a good introduction to the game. Mm-hmm. The premier starter decks were not really that competitive, but they did include a few cards in each one that were very, very strong that you couldn't find in booster packs. Those are called fixed rarity cards, so you could uh-huh. only get them by buying the theme decks. And those cards were are still popular today. We still see some of those, so cards like that are Lady Justice, uh, which is a uh, purple friend that makes things uh, um, make, makes your opponent's friends uh, less powerful, mm. and cards uh, like Holly Dash, who is a, uh, a blue friend, so she works very well with Rainbow Dash, that allows you to save action tokens by moving many friends across the field for very, very cheap. Oh yeah, yeah. Right, you may be familiar with that one. 
Uh, I played someone, I played someone, and it was really annoying. <laughs> Oh yeah, it's very annoying. That's called uh, the the name the group has assigned to it is Conga Line. If you're familiar <laughs> with the Conga Line, where everyone just kind of hops on and da, 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 and move three friends at once. So it's it's frustrating. Hmm. Um, but starting with a theme deck is actually necessary in this game because it's one of the only ways that you're going to get main characters from the uh, premiere set and a lot of the uh, mains that were reprinted in or a lot of the main characters that were printed in Canterlot Knights that are available in booster packs are not guaranteed to be there so it can be difficult to find one Mm. so what's the rarity like in uh, getting the cards from one box because in Vanguard there's in one box there's only 30 cards and in one pack there's only 5 cards so the rarity is going to be something like you will get three triple rares, uh, five double rares, and whatever the rest is going to be um, single rares. So, sure. what is it? How how do you gauge the rarities in a box of the boosters in ponies? That's a good question. Um, ponies uses a couple different rarities for their cards. So, like most other card games, you're going to have common cards and you're going to have uncommon cards. Uh, Ponies also has rare cards and ultra-rare cards. Uh, Ultra-rares are far less common, obviously. Um, The neat thing is that uh, ponies have more uh, cards in the booster packs than something you'd find like Pokemon or Vanguard, but less cards than Magic. So Magic has 15 cards in a booster pack. Pokemon has 10 cards or 9 cards in a booster pack. I think it's Mm -hmm. 10 cards. And Ponies has 12, so it's in that nice medium point. There's 36 booster packs in a full box of uh, My Little Pony. And in one box, you will probably find anywhere from 3 to 5 ultra rares in that box. So about 1 out of every 12 packs or so. Uh, And then everything else will end up being rare. However... It is possible for some of the cards in a set to be printed as a foil, and those cards that are printed as foils can be commons, uncommons, or rares, but not every card is available as a foil, so that's different. Whereas in Magic, you can find every single card as a foil, provided it's you know from some of the newer sets. Mm-hmm. In Ponies, there's only certain cards that are available as foil or non-foil. However, every ultra rare card is automatically a foil. So you oh. don't have to worry about, oh, I need to get the the shiny version of this card. No, you're mm-hmm. fine. If it's if it's if you got an ultra rare, they give you the benefit and they just make it shiny <laughs> automatically. So right. that's good. So what you're saying is essentially in one box there's going to be 3 to 5 automatically. There's no guarantee, just like in all other card games, but mm-hmm. from my personal experience, yes, that is what I've seen. I have heard of boxes that only had two, uh, so I I think it would be better to go two to five. Mm. Uh, But yes, you will find generally generally between two to five ultra rares in a box, with the remainder all being rares. And the neat thing about ponies, I like this very much, is that if you receive an ultra rare in your booster pack, the ultra rare takes the spot of one of the common or uncommon cards. Um, because any time there's a foil card in your pack, it takes the spot of that. And since all ultra rares are foil, that's what it's taking the spot of, mm-hmm. which means if you get a pack that has an ultra rare, you also have a regular rare in that pack as well. Mm, okay. So it's very, very nice to see. Well, I'm a bit confused with how the rating system with Pony works because, well, I haven't seen the breakdown of it because, uh, uh, sorry, because I don't really understand how the structure works because, well, I come from Vanguard and when Vanguard does something, it's split into clans and there's also a spoiler list online where they say what goes what and what does what. So sure. for me, if I'm playing this clan, I need not worry about the rest. I just have to worry about my clans. And right. how many rare cards do I have in this set? How many do I need to spend? Blah, blah, blah. So if I'm going to buy one box... How many people can I share it with? So, it's for me, it's a bit um, different when it comes to the Western kind of card games like Magic or even the Ponies because sure, I'm I'm just I'm, I'm totally confused. Sorry, <laughs> bring parts. Oh no no no, no 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 that's fine. So let me see if I can explain it a little bit. Uh, Western card uh, expansions 
are oftentimes larger than Eastern card game uh, expansions. So let's take a set like, uh, or let's take a card game like Ponies, okay? Mm-hmm. Uh, Premier and Canterlot Knights both had approximately 200 different cards in their sets. So they're rel- they're relatively large compared to what you'd find with you know smaller uh, Eastern uh, card game expansions. Mm-hmm. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think I think that's correct, right? Yeah, one pack would have five cards. Right. Like how many how many different cards are printed in one expansion? I don't mean how many cards mm-hmm. in a box. I mean Let's how see. many different. Um, I think the highest they went was with 150. Okay. Okay. So yeah, Western uh, Western card game expansions are oftentimes larger. Uh, so ponies, each one was at about uh, two hundred or about two hundred, like I said, uh, with some large Magic the Gathering sets, you can get upwards of two hundred and fifty cards. Uh, the way that most of these cards are designed, though, is since very few Western games are going to have such an important focus on clans or color or element in this case for this game. That means that each one is going to be represented relatively equally. So for instance, if you're a fan of Fluttershy strategy in this deck, which is basically playing a lot of very cheap, very small uh, critters, uh, very very uh, efficient friends, and just overwhelming your opponent by playing many, many, many uh, friends at once... Mm -hmm. Um, you'll have just as many cards printed in one particular set in your element, in your color, yellow, than the player who enjoys playing Twilight Sparkle uh, or Luna, who is uh, purple, who is focusing on more spells and effects and card draw and not so much playing a lot of friends as well. So each one is represented equally in terms of the number of cards they get in the set. Mm, so okay. what I'm, if I'm understanding this right, so each color... Uh, so the 250 represents um, not all. Sorry, um, each card or each color has a set base of cards that, when combined, reach 250. That's correct. So if you think about it, you've got uh, all the different friends uh, mm-hmm. that you're going to be playing, and the friends are what you need to solve problems. You've got your events, which are like your spell cards or your trap cards, if you play uh, Yu-Gi-Oh! or things like mm-hmm. that. Um, they're like instants and sorceries, if you play Magic. You've got your resources, which are like artifacts and enchantments, if you play uh, Magic the Gathering as well. They stay along on the field. And then you've got uh, Troublemakers as well, and we will, like I said, talk about Troublemakers mm-hmm. later. True, true, true. Um, Uh, and then uh, a few problems as well. So all those different cards combined are going to add up to 250 cards in a set. And out, or uh, for for Magic, 250. For Ponies, about 200. And the distribution of uh, rare uh, in the set is out of about 200 cards. You've got a little over 60 that are at the common rarity, Mm. a little over 60 that are at the uncommon rarity, and a little over 60 that are either rare or ultra rare. So it's about a one third, about a 33% chance, uh, or a 33% of each rarity, uh, card being printed. And that's higher than what we see in Magic the Gathering. Mm. So take, take a large set of Magic that just came out. Uh, Norman, you play, you play Magic, so you're familiar with the Theros block. Yes, yes. Okay. So Theros had 250 cards in it. And out of those 250 cards, there were about 50 cards that were either rare or mythic. Okay? Mm -hmm. So that's only 20% of the cards in the set were at rare or higher. In My Little Pony, you had a little over 60 with 200 cards total. That means it's about 33% of the different cards printed in the set were either rare or ultra-rare. That means it's oftentimes, in My Little Pony, harder for you to find that one rare that you're looking for just by buying booster boxes than it is to find it in a game like Magic. Mm, So you're saying that ponies are harder then? (laughs) I'm saying ponies are definitely more expensive early on in their game. Mm. So it's part of the reason that you see uh, such a wide price variation in the cost of certain cards. So think about Magic, right? Mm -hmm. With Theros, the most expensive card you'd find in there, not counting foils, just the most expensive card, would probably be about, oh, let's say $20. Wouldn't you say that's about right? Yeah, I guess so, depending on conversion rate. Um, for example, Elspeth for my country would be 80 ringgit. So 
times the one ring uh, one ringgit would be your three dollars. So you do the math. I, I'm stupid right now. Right. No, that's fine. So it's a little over twenty dollars for you. You're looking about twenty. 26 or so. So so it might just be a little bit higher. Uh, whereas in My Little Pony, uh, the cards that you can find in the premiere set, there are some cards that are at almost $60 a piece. So that would what? basically be almost 200 ringgit. What? <laughs> yeah, yeah, what? Really? And yes, really. So believe it or not, uh, if you are talking about buying just booster packs for either Magic the Gathering Mm -hmm. or for My Little Pony, you will find more monetary value if you get a good rare out of My Little Pony than you will out of current (laughs) Magic the Gathering sets. Wow. Oh, okay. Okay, here's here's, here's a random one, totally out of the blue. Um, Sure. When someone gets a certain rare card that the shop wants, Mm -hmm. and the guy who got it trades it with you for packs, do you do that? That's a good question. Uh... The store that I work at, which is named Crazy Squirrel Game Store, and there's a, a link to our page uh, in the description as well, mm-hmm. um, does purchase cards from players. Uh, when we do this, it's not so much a trade as much as it is we're offering them store credit for the card. Ah. So if someone comes in and says, I have this card, I would like to get some booster packs, we say, sure. And we look it up and we pay a percentage of what the market value of that card is in store credit. Usually it's about uh, two-thirds to three-quarters of the card's uh, market value. And we say, we'll give you this much for this card, and you can use all that store credit on whatever you want. It can be booster packs. It can be other individual cards cards that we sell. It can be other games in our store as well. Uh-huh. So that allows, and that's actually neat, it allows players uh, who are normally just card game players to be able to get involved in some of the other hobbies that we support as well. Oh, that that is cool. I mean, that, that seriously, that is that is the first time I hear someone do that because over here, um, I, I play another card game called Buddy Fight and the Buddy Fight system uses clans also. So whenever I crack a booster... And I get mm-hmm. a card that I don't play, and it's it's a foil, and say to the shopkeeper, hey, what can I get for this? Oh, he say, you can get another three packs. So I oh. crack another three pack, and oh, I get another. So it goes on and on with that one game. It doesn't spit sure. out. And that's the neat thing, is being able to support other games is a great way to get people to participate. Because you think about it, it's much, much easier to get a person who already plays games of some sort into a collectible card game Mm -hmm. than it is to get some random person off the street who's never played, you know, any sort of uh, board game or, or card game before to get involved. So, likewise, it's very easy to get a person who already understands the way that certain games work into, say, board games or tactical miniatures games or even... Even role-playing games uh, mm. than it is for you to uh, just get a random, you know, Joe Schmo who has never mm. had experience with this. So supporting other hobbies in the store, I think, is very, very important. I do like that. I mean, personally, for me, hearing this makes me tingle with joy just because if I get a card that I don't play, instead of keeping it for a collection or just trading it for another card, I could just trade in for store credit and buy that board game that I really want to play, Battlestar Galactica. Oh, yes. That's a great game. <laughs> uh, but, you know, it's a very good point. And that's one of the other nice things as well, is being able to trade in cards for store credit means that even if you don't know what you want right then, you can save it for later. So we allow players to keep store credit on a gift card or on their account uh. as well. So if you know, ah, uh, there's a new set coming out soon and I want to buy some packs, I'll trade in some of my cards that I'm not really playing right now so I can save up for that. Or... Well, there's this one card I want, but it's, you know, $60. I'll (laughs) save up my money, and I'll trade in a few cards. And as I trade in enough cards, I'll eventually be able to buy it. Oh, wow. This is a cool system that you have here. I mean, Crazy Squirrel is crazy. (laughs) Crazy Squirrel is pretty crazy. But we do our best uh, to uh, provide one of the best gaming experiences in Central California for anyone. Um, We've got an amazing group of gamers who continue to support our store. Uh, the store was opened about four years ago, a little less than four years ago, by a husband and wife couple uh, who have been gamers their entire life, uh, role-playing games and uh, tabletop board games and uh, all sorts of other all sorts of other types of games. Uh, and within three years of being open, the store had expanded to 4,000 square feet, so it is enormous now. Uh, we have. Uh, 
pre-release events for collectible card games that come out. We have uh, board game nights where people who aren't experienced in games can come in and learn to play, and people will be happy to teach them. We have a theme night for My Little Pony collectible card game every single Wednesday in our store. We run tournaments about twice a month for it on the weekends as well. Uh, it's just a great experience, and it's one of the largest stores you're going to find in California. So just a bit of a plug here. <laughs> if you are in Central California or even the Bay Area or even Los Angeles, come see us sometime. I will be happy to sit there and teach you the My Little Pony collectible card game. We have all sorts of events for it, and we'd love to see you come by. Awesome. I'll make a mental note to go there when I do visit the U.S. one day. <laughs> hey, California is the easiest stop for you. Yay. Hey, Ron, why don't you ask another question from James? And how much do you think you need to spend on this game in order to have a decent deck? That's always the question when it comes to collectible card games. Um, Collectible card games are difficult because they are collectible. That means that some people are going to be buying the cards just because they like to have the full set. Others are going to be buying the cards because they want to have the best deck possible, and others are going to be buying the cards just because they like the art on them. It depends on whether or not you're going to be a casual or a competitive player, and that's no different than other collectible card games or other trading card games. Uh, right, Norman? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That's true, that's true. So you can buy uh, a you know cards that you enjoy and have a deck that functions perfectly fine just for sitting around and playing with your friends for... I mean, honestly, you could just do that with a theme deck. The theme decks that are made for Canterlot Knights are more powerful, I think, than the theme decks that were made for... Uh, the premiere set, and that's probably just, you know, experience as they're developing the game. Mm -hmm. So you can buy a theme deck for about 11 US dollars. So they're very, very affordable to get, uh, to get involved with. Uh, if you're talking about competitive play, that's where it gets a little bit different. It depends on, again, which deck you're talking about. Uh, if we look just at the highest rated decks for tournaments, uh, the cheapest Highest rated deck in existence right now is a deck called Ballroom Blitz, which features Fluttershy, of all people, and all sorts of little critters. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it costs about $150 if you wanted to build it. So, oh, my. Is it a full set or just one card? Uh, the Well, that's an interesting question. So the 150 is the full deck, the okay. full 45-card deck plus the 10 problems that you need. Okay, and okay. the on, and the only reason, and that's probably a little high, it's probably cheaper than that. The only reason it's that expensive is because it includes a couple copies of a card that are about fifty or fifty five dollars a piece. Ooh. If it were not for if it were not for those cards, this deck would be like twenty bucks to build. So that's that's what I'm talking about, where those rares that are very, very difficult to find are suddenly very, very expensive. That's because there's so many rares that were printed in the set. And mm-hmm. isn't it fitting that that card is rarity itself? <laughs> So, oh god. Uh, so that that is about the cheapest, highest competitive deck that you will see right now. And by highest competitive, this deck has won and placed in many spots of the top eight of the most recent tournaments. So this is a very very effective deck. Uh, if you are talking about uh, the most expensive deck that has existed for. Uh, the uh, for competitive play, it was probably for Premiere when it was just Premiere and Canterlot Knights didn't exist. Mm-hmm. There was a deck uh, featuring Rarity as the main character called Taxes, and Taxes was designed exactly like it sounds. <laughs> you were just going to go there and make everything as expensive as possible by making people pay extra to do whatever it was they wanted to do. Do you want to play a friend? It's going to cost you extra tokens. Do you want to move that friend? It's going to cost you extra tokens. And I'm going to send that friend home, so you have to pay to move him twice. And all sorts of other ridiculous things like that. That deck ran many, many ultra rares in it, and all of the ultra rares were very expensive. So at its peak, that deck was about $650 US dollars to build. Wow, Ooh, that is expensive. Talk about loving, talk about expensive hobby, talk about rarity. 
<laughs> oh, that's very true. But see, that's the thing that's nice, is that even these very competitive decks can still end up losing to a more casual deck. There's a lot of variance. So it's not a guaranteed win just because you're playing the most expensive cards. Mm. I played uh, I played a Ballroom Blitz at our most recent uh, tournament that we had at Crazy Squirrel, and I did well, but I didn't win every single round. I ended up losing a round because I just didn't have good draws, and my opponent had a much better start than I did. It was a mm-hmm. close game. Uh, and so that's the nice thing, is don't worry so much about having to go and buy the most competitive deck immediately. This is a game that's designed to be fun for players, and it's it does have good competitive play support right now, and it's continuing to grow, but... Start with a deck that you like. Add cards as you see them that work well with that strategy. Mm -hmm. And then if you decide this deck still isn't working out, go online, get some ideas, ask questions, and look and see what other competitive players are building, and that can give you a starting point for yours. Mm. And I I like to add this. Uh, It depends on your budget and how serious you want to take this game, because you can start off saying that I want to go pro with this. So by that point, what do you mean by pro? Is it joining every tournament available and going to every GP that's out there and winning the goal? If that's the case, then you need to spend a lot of money to build the perfect deck so that you could win. For example, like that $600 deck. (laughs) Which thankfully isn't needed anymore. Mm -hmm. Uh, But you're right. Um, not every player is going to want to sit there and go full pro, where they say, yes, I'm going to go to every large competitive event that exists. You can be perfectly happy, have a great deal of fun, and still have a very effective deck just playing at local tournaments near your game store. And Mm. oftentimes, there are plenty of prizes that are offered there as well. If you don't get the chance to travel much, if you're still relatively young, or if you can't afford to travel across the country, which oftentimes is going to be required for large competitive events, Mm -hmm. start small and build as you go. That's how I ended up getting introduced to Magic. I played Magic a little bit when I was in junior high school. I stopped for a few years and then picked it up again when I was in high school, stopped for a few years, and then picked it up again when I started working at the uh, game store because I figured, well, we sell this game. I should probably know how to play it again. <laughs> and I started, uh, off, I started off casually but built up and built up, and eventually I decided when I wanted to play competitively, I will build a competitive deck. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that's fine. It takes time. Mm, true that, true that. I, I think the key word is competitive deck because if you want to really go to any pro tournament or large scale tournament like the one that happened in Babscon or right now, well, you never this break. is going. Yeah, right. It's not really right now because when this show comes out, it was already a past timing, mm. right? But anywho, right. yeah. If you want to go there, then yes, build a competitive deck. If you're just going for experience and you don't really have the cash, you know. Just go there, have fun. The key word is having fun. It doesn't right. have to be an expensive deck. It doesn't have to be a cheap deck. As long as you're having fun and learning, that's the key word. That's exactly right. Because when it comes down to it, this is a game at the end of the day. It's a collectible game. Uh, mm-hmm. So you can you can collect the cards if you want your full set. You can build the cards that are needed to have the best deck. Or you can just play for fun. Imagine mm-hmm. that, playing a game to have fun. <laughs> Who would have thought? Yeah, who have thunk that? Talking about games, having fun, and cheap decks. I recently had a game of Yu-Gi-Oh with a friend, and I never, t- I haven't touched Yu-Gi-Oh in about four or five years, just because oh, I wow. don't really like the game anymore because of rule system and whatnot. Ban list. Sure. Uh, let's just say I, out of touch. But I kept this one deck, which is called Final Countdown. Ah uh, yes. That deck is really mean. Essentially, what I do is I play by myself, and that opponent needs to win within 20 turns. So my opponent had this one uber cool deck with a lot of fusion monsters and synchros and whatnot, and it was Mm -hmm. really scary. But to me, when I played it, when I when I played him, I didn't need to do anything much. I just set my things, and well, your move. I just wait for you to lose. Yep. Which is really mean, but in terms of competitiveness, that is not the deck to be playing in any tournament. There's a similar deck that exists that I had mentioned earlier in this podcast called One Pace, and I'll I'll describe it briefly for players Mm -hmm. who aren't familiar with it here. It's really goofy to look up. This is, uh, like you're talking about, kind of a combo deck. 
It mm-hmm. gets the necessary pieces that it needs. It doesn't worry so much about what its opponent is doing. As long as the opponent can't stop you, that's really all you need to be sure of. Mm-hmm. Uh, and one pace works by playing uh, friends that allow you to draw cards for free, basically. Cool. Y- you can draw cards as long as that friend is involved in a face-off. And face-offs are the key mechanic of the collectible card game. You you want to get into face-offs so that you can score extra points. And there are cards that were printed in Canterlot Knights that allow you to force face-offs between one friend and another friend. So the idea of this deck is you begin forcing face-offs between this one friend who allows you to, uh, when you when he's involved in a face-off, uh, get basically a a counter beneath him and then spend that counter to draw a few cards. And you do this, triggering face-offs on an opponent's friend who can't really fight back, um, drawing cards as you need them, playing these cards, gaining action tokens, gaining resources through a card that basically works like Black Lotus in Magic the (laughs) Gathering, if you're familiar with that. Um, And then thinning your deck out and drawing and drawing and drawing and drawing until your deck is just one or two cards. And at that point, you play a troublemaker who uh, allows you when he turns up to uh, take uh, each player takes their discard pile and shuffles it back into their deck. (laughs) So you play your deck, filtering through it, getting the cards that you need, drawing cards, gaining action tokens, and uh, slowly, slowly gaining points. And then just when your opponent thinks, ah, he's almost out of cards in his deck, he's not going to be able to do this anymore, you shuffle your deck back in and keep doing it again. <laughs> so it, it, it pilots like solitaire, and it's incredibly aggravating uh, to play against if you don't enjoy that kind of deck. I personally think they're hilarious. I think it's I think it's really really fun to play just because of the interactions that it has with your own cards, but unfortunately it has almost no interaction that your opponent can do anything about. And so uh, when we were testing this out, my friends and I, uh, we built uh, One Pace and tried it out. And we were playing it very seriously because the reason One Pace isn't competitive right now Mm -hmm. is it takes a lot of time to go through the combo. And there's a hard cap of 30 minutes on the game that you play in My Little Uh... Pony, which is very, very short for card games. Mm -hmm. Uh, Magic the Gathering, I think, plays at 45 or 50 minute rounds, and My Little Pony is a 30 minute, uh, whoever has the highest point total at the end of that wins. So, we tested it out. Uh, My friend started his combo, uh, started going through the motions with 21 minutes remaining on the clock. Oh. And and in that same turn, so this was all one turn, not passing it back and forth, he finished with two minutes remaining on the clock. Ooh. So this was, this was a 19 minute turn. <laughs> the hell? And this was not him sitting there and being idle. He was playing cards at a breakneck pace, trying to get through <laughs> this as fast as possible. So that's part of the reason it's not competitive. But it's like what you're talking about. Once you get the pieces you need, your opponent just pretty much loses and can do nothing but sit there and watch you laugh as you go about what you need. <laughs> mm, oh, okay. So that's one pace. That's an interesting deck format. <laughs> It is, it is. And it's funny, because One Pace um, was designed to be the second combo deck. The first combo deck that was created used uh, some interactions with a few cards that were printed in Canterlot Knights, but the, those interactions were viewed as too powerful by Interplay, and since there aren't so many cards printed right now that can provide answers for disruption and things like that, Interplay actually went and did something very strange, which was to errata a card after it had already been printed to change how it worked. Not to clear up, not to clear up bad text, but to actually affect how the card worked so that that combo could no longer be done. Mm, so basically, what Yu-Gi-Oh is doing with their card game right now? Okay. Are they doing that? Yeah, there's a card called Dark Dive Bomber, which essentially allows you to do an OTK. Now that card is, you can only use this ability once per turn. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, it was a, basically a similar thing that was done on this card. Uh, mm. You you were prevented from using this more than about once in a turn. So, mm. But I expect to see combo decks continue to grow. I think combo decks actually can be healthy for a game. Uh, mm, yeah, because true, true. It's, it's a fun, it's a fun um, archetype of deck to play for certain players. And as long as there are tools that are capable of disrupting that combo or stopping it in some way, shape, or form or at least beating it if the combo is very, very slow to actually go off, like if you need to wait for a few turns, Mm -hmm. it's fine. 
it's only when the combo becomes very, very reliable and unstoppable once it starts that you have a problem. And mm. as My Little Pony continues to add more cards to their, you know, more expansions and things like that, I'm sure we'll see more answers to combos in the future. Mm, that's true, that's true, because in Yu-Gi-Oh! it's all about the combos. If you don't build a combo deck, you're not going to go far. Ah, okay. Back to the very beginning, how did you become a judge? Well, like I had said, uh, the best way to become a judge was to sign up for that volunteer program. Mm -hmm. Um, There's no real official title for judges right now, so I will say that. Uh, However, I did organize and help run the uh, tournament that we had at BabsCon, which is as close as you get to being a judge at this point in time. Mm. Uh, The things you need to do in order to be a judge are to have great familiarity with the rules of the game. And I don't just mean the basic rule book that's included. I mean the 30-page, you know, uh, very, very detailed rules uh, that are available on Enterplay's website. Mm -hmm. Um, So you need to understand all the little interactions of the game. So basically, uh, from, you need to be a lawyer then. <laughs> oh yes, and it helps that my father was a lawyer for a while, so hey, oh. I, I can I can read these and I can understand what's going on. Um, however, uh, it's more than just knowing the rules. Being a judge isn't about proving that you're right. Being a mm-hmm. judge isn't about uh, showing everyone that you know the game better than they do. Mm-hmm. Being a judge is about encouraging growth of the game introducing new players, and being there to help players to ensure that everyone gets the most enjoyment possible from this uh, game. All right, all that's, right, all right. that's really what it's there for. So for those of you who are interested in becoming judges, I'll ask you before you decide if you want to do that to see if your heart's in the right place. Being a judge is not necessarily for everyone. There's a lot of self-sacrifice that goes into it. It means that if you become a judge, oftentimes you won't be able to play in the same tournaments that you are organizing, Mm -hmm. which can be frustrating for people who just wanted to play the game. It also means that people are going to be looking to you as someone to provide them with answers, and not in games, but outside of games, advice on it as well. So that means you need to enjoy working with the people in this community. You want to help them. You want to help them get better. And if that's something you think you'd enjoy, I'd encourage you to sign up on the volunteer form that we have. If not, that's fine. You can still continue to be a great player and still offer advice for people, but maybe being a judge isn't what you're looking for. Mm, Understandable, understandable. It's one of those situations where I know the game, but I don't want to interact with people in that sense. Sure, and there's nothing wrong with that. It's not for everyone, and it's a lot of work that goes into it, because being a judge means you have to set up events, you have to plan the organization of them, you have to be there calling out uh, you know, match results and uh, giving announcements and things like that. You will lose your voice if you become mm-hmm. a judge at a con, I will tell you that much. I was taking throat lozenges, and I still had my voice gone by the second day. Oh my. Uh, so... Uh, it's it's a lot of work, but it's really rewarding to see the positive impact you can have on a new game like this. Hmm, that's what I want to see too, where you build it up from scratch and there it is, like other people are playing. So I can imagine what you're feeling. That, that's awesome. Mm-hmm. So how many tournaments have you judged? That's a good question. Um, in terms of major tournaments, I've done a few. The biggest one by far was BabsCon. Uh, so that was the 70-person tournament that they had there on, I think, the uh, the first night. And that was a lot of fun to do. Uh, our store, uh, my store, Crazy Squirrel Game Store, uh, where I work, has done weekly events for My Little Pony since about March. Um, mm-hmm. And we do uh, kind of a casual play on every Wednesday night. And if players are interested on Wednesday night, we'll do quick pickup tournaments. So people pay five bucks and they get in, and everyone gets a prize at the end of the night, even if they lost every single round. But if you win rounds, you get more prizes. So mm-hmm. it's it's fun to ensure that everyone leaves with a little something, even if it's just one booster pack. Mm-hmm. Um, in terms of larger events at my store, uh, our store was one of the ones that was featured to do a pre-release event for Canterlot Knights, oh, and that was cool. a lot of fun. So we got to uh, see those cards and play with some of them about a week before uh, <laughs> they went on sale. Spoilers! 
Oh, yeah, it was great. It was great. Even though there were a few hiccups in how everything worked, there were some printing errors of decks and things like that. It was mm-hmm. it was okay. It worked out all right. Um, and we received a kit that could support up to 24 players, uh, and we had 22 show up, so we <laughs> almost filled out. It was amazing. Oh, that's uh, cool. So that was really, really neat. We've also run a few more competitive events on the weekends. Uh, most of our competitive tournaments are going to be on either Saturdays or Sundays to enable people to travel a bit. So, mm-hmm. again, anyone there in California, we're only a short drive. We're right in the middle of the state. Um, and we've done a draft tournament before. We actually oh. kind of made up our draft rules for that based on some things we had seen in a conversation I had had with Trevor. Uh, and we are also scheduled for a store championship uh, at the end of this month, about July 20th. So with the store championship, that will be the most competitive event that we've had at our store individually because the winner, uh, the first place uh, for that tournament, receives an invitation to the Nationals at uh, Gen Con this year. Wow, I am hyped, and I'm not even playing the game. Mm. So it's very, very exciting. Uh, total in terms of number of tournaments I've organized uh, and and participated in, it's upwards of 20 now at this point, uh, counting the weekly events. In terms of large tournaments, I've done about four or five, and there are more coming. I actually have a tournament tomorrow that we're organizing in practice oh. for the store championship. Awesome, awesome. So um, is it just you who's judging the games at Crazy Squirrel, or is there other judges too? It is just me right now. Uh, there are there are other people, uh, some of my friends, who are uh, becoming more and more familiar with the rules, uh, but they haven't expressed a desire to participate in judging. And again, like I said earlier, that's totally fine. If they want to enjoy just playing the game and understanding all the intricacies of how it works, that's completely okay. Um, and I'm more than happy to continue running the judge events here in the store. The group is still small enough right now to where it doesn't really need more than one judge. With a weekly event uh, that draws in about 8 to 12 people, and then with larger, more competitive events once or twice a month, you don't really need more than one judge right now. But... I'm always happy to teach new players about the rules, and if someone does express an interest in judging, I have no problem with giving them the opportunity to do that. So if you're interested in judging for an event, go talk with your local game store, whoever they may be. Tell them, I want to do this. Become familiar with the rules. Talk with the community online. Check with the rules group on Facebook. We'll post a link there for you so that you can answer any questions you may have. And at that point, just try and get involved. Mm, I, I, I'm hyped right now, and I want to do this. Like, uh, now, now I'm I glad. Get, now I need to get cards. Uh, oh, that's the, okay. And friends. Yeah, that's, that's <laughs> the hardest one. Oh, it can't be. But it's fun. I think that's one of the things that's neat about My Little Pony as well, is because there's a big uh, interest in this game with the Brony community, it means that it's not just a great way to meet other card game players, it's a great way to meet other Bronies as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. And people who you may not have known would be interested in the game. That mm-hmm. doesn't mean that everyone who plays this game is a Brony, though. There's a lot of people I've introduced to this game who, when they you know first see us selling cards, where I think, oh, sure, My Little Pony you know what a, what a terrible game and oh, everyone no. assumes it's everyone assumes it's this game made for you know 5 or 6 year old girls oh, like the no. show was originally designed no this is a very complicated game um it, it it can be for sure when i was teaching one of our local magic players who plays competitively uh this game uh he sat there and complained about his head hurting because of <laughs> having to think about this game in a different way. So when we can take a competitive Magic player and he can say this is a complex game and a well-designed game, you know there's something going there. Oh, yeah. I mean, back on the game design itself, I've heard one of my friends say that this game is similar to um, the Warhammer 40k card game. Mm -hmm, Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And at first glance, you won't think that. Like, you you and me or in the general public eyes would say haha this is a pony game this is for five year old girls ha ha sure. and when, once you play it oh my goodness me oof no no there's a lot of interactions going on here and a lot of the skeleton of the game is very similar to other collectible card games at the time it is complex 
if you have younger brothers, sisters, or relatives who would like the art on these cards, feel free to go out and pick them up a deck. But there is a reason that it says 12 plus on the box, and it's not because of any sort of mature content. It's because this game is hard. So it can, mm, yep, yep. It, it can, it can be difficult. Now, that is, of course, talking about the most competitive level. If you're talking about just sitting there playing casually, this game is still easy enough to pick up and learn. You're going to have to think about it in a different way than you will other card games. You're not worried about directly stopping your opponent. You're just worried about beating them in a race, effectively. Mm-hmm. And it's a matter of how you choose to do that. Do you want to go as fast as possible and you know be like Rainbow Dash and just sprint towards the finish with everything you've got? Or do you want to be like Twilight and be more methodical and just kind of slowly reach that point while making sure that you're not tiring out like your opponent might be? So mm. it's it's it actually themes very, very well with the main characters that you're playing. Rainbow Dash plays in a deck uh, uh, with many, many friends that trigger those conga lines we spoke about earlier, where you're moving multiple friends at once for free, saving a lot of action tokens, and just overwhelming your opponents. And one of the top-tier decks that was created in Premiere was called Rainbow Dash Wins. <laughs> um, RDW, which is very similar to Red Deck Wins, and a very similar playstyle for you Magic players out there. So, uh, it, it's neat how the themes of the show can be represented by the effects of the cards. And that's something you don't hear every day in terms of card games, in terms of the Bushiroad card games like the Vanguards. Yeah, it's based on the anime, but yeah, it's based on the anime, so that's a given. But with sure. ponies, you have to build something that's from show and try to make it similar in the sense of, okay, Rainbow Dash, she likes to go fast. Rarity, she likes fashion and she likes generosity. What can we do? And Applejack, she likes to buck apples. And yep. Twilight, <laughs> books. So, I mean, based things around that, how do you do that? And also, you have Celestia and Luna now, so mm-hmm. how do you do that? Right, what roles are you playing there? Uh, and they've done a good job of, of emulating that. You know, there's different play styles uh, of collectible card games. You're going to have players who enjoy playing very, very fast, all-in decks where you're committing right at the beginning. You're going to have players who enjoy... Uh, more control, having more answers, more options, uh, drawing cards, and hopefully being able to stop their opponent or at least slow them down. And then you'll have players who will just enjoy playing very, very powerful cards as well. Mm. And I think all of those effects are represented here. So Twilight and Rarity, um, being very, very intellectual, uh, have a lot of the control cards uh, in their colors. Uh, Rainbow Dash a- uh, has a lot of the cards that just commit over, uh, you know, a- cheap friends that you can play down, and, you know, they're very, very fast. Fluttershy, with all the critters that she takes care of, just overwhelms your opponent in a horde of critters that pour forth from your hand. Whereas Applejack, uh, in orange, has a lot of very, very powerful cards on their own, uh, that you can just drop one or two of these down and be at a huge advantage over what your opponent would normally have. And Pinkie Pie is random, just as she is in the show. That's actually her keyword mechanic is called random. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. What's random again? I, I forgot. Uh, during a face-off with this card, if you flip a very, very low power card off the top of your deck, one power, uh, mm-hmm. you can ignore it and flip a different card instead. And that's for multiple times? Uh, it's yes. That that is a mechanic that stacks. So oh. if you have if you have three friends at a problem that have uh, random, and the first card you flip for the face off is a one, you can ignore it. The second card you flip for the face off is a one, you can ignore that. The third card you flip for a face off is a one, you can ignore that, and the fourth one then you'd have to take. Really? So until four times then. If you have uh, multiple friends who have it there, so if you have one, you can uh-huh. ignore one one power card for each instance of random that you have involved in that face-off. Oh, so it doesn't stack like crazy, like Pinkie Pie can do it four times on herself. No, right, just once. right, right, just once per character that has uh, that effect there. All right, all right, all right. I, I thought it stacks like crazy. Oh, okay. <laughs> No, no, it doesn't stack, it doesn't stack that crazily, but it's still really fun. And Pinky also has a lot of, um, a lot of effects as well that just kind of make you sit there and go, what? <laughs> as you're, as you're looking. Uh, one of the most flavorful cards we've seen 
is um, a deck or is a card called Pinkie Pie Element of Laughter. It's a very, very expensive card to play. I'm not talking money-wise. I'm talking action token-wise in the Mm -hmm. game. So it comes down very, very late. But when it does, you reveal the top card of your deck, and you look at that card's power. Then you put that card back, and whatever that card's power was, you look at the top cards of your deck equal to that power. So if you reveal, you know, a three, you look at the top three cards uh, of your deck equal to that power. Um, You put any number of pink friends, so pink colored friends from those into your hand and put the and shuffle the other cards. But your opponent then gets to draw cards as well. So what she's doing is she's making friends. She's going out there and she's getting everyone friends because that's exactly what Pinky wants to do. Wow. And that's a cool that's a cool way to see that. Yeah, that is awesome. <laughs> okay, wow. This this is awesome. This is awesome. Wow. I'm- I'm like, glad you're enjoying this. I, I like seeing people uh, building hype off this card game. I, I'm just thinking about certain things. Like I, I've played it before, and looking at Twilight, looking at Rainbow Dash, and looking at Fluttershy, and look, even looking at um, yeah, just looking at Fluttershy, their playstyle is similar to them, and yeah, I can see it. With Pinkie Pie, what can you see with her? Pinkie Pie is definitely a strange one. Uh, but she's she's fun, and she has a lot of instances of uh, herself in the game. There's a lot of cards with Pinkie Pie on them, and that makes it really, really fun. There was someone who suggested as a joke a while ago uh, that we needed more Pinkie Pie cards so that he could play a deck of nothing but Pinkie Pie cards uh, with the problem named too many Pinkie Pies or not enough Pinkie Pies. Uh, <laughs> I thought that was great. Oh, that's dope. Mm, and they should do it, man. And they should do it. <laughs> I mean, we're getting there. We have currently, um, give me a moment to think about it. One, two, three, four. So we've got at least five different versions of Pinkie Pie right now, not counting the main character. So that's oh. 15 out of 45 cards in your deck. Wow. So we're, we're a third of the way there with only Yay. two expansions <laughs> to the all Pinkie Pie deck. Tell oh, your friends. Oh, God. Oh, that's going to be awesome. Oh, boy. Okay, well, I I need to recoup my thoughts for a while. Oh, God. <laughs> sure, no problem. Oh, okay, um, so uh, I think we talk about this and that and compare this game with the other games. But, so let's finally talk about this game by itself, by its own merits. So you mentioned troublemakers, problems, and characters and friends. So a brief breakdown, what are these cards? Sure. So there are four main types of cards that you're going to see in the collectible card game. You've got friends, and friends are the only cards that are going to provide you with the power that you need to uh, beat the problems of Ponyville, to confront those problems and to allow you to score points. Other cards are going to have power printed on them, but that's just so that they're used for face-offs. So friends are the bread and butter of your deck. You need friends in the colors of your main character, and usually a second color as well, uh, to enable you to confront the problems. And the reason for this is that problems, which are uh, a set separate deck from your regular deck uh, are the things which allow you to score points. And if it's your own problem, it requires you to actually have two different colors involved, usually one that you associate with your main character and a different color of your choice. Uh, And this is really interesting because that, again, fits with the flavor of you can't solve things on your own. You need to end up having your friends to help you. It will make things much easier for you to solve problems. And I like that flavor. That's neat that it's represented that way. Um, let's talk about uh, troublemakers for a moment. Troublemakers are one of the biggest sources of trouble, go figure, uh, for new players in this game because they function very, very differently. Troublemakers are cards, uh, antagonists or villains that you'd see from the show. So you'll have characters like Flim and Flam. You'll have different colors of Paris sprites. You'll have Queen Chrysalis. You'll have Aoi Zotal. You'll have uh, Nightmare Moon. And they're all designed to make it more difficult for your opponent to end up m- confronting their problem on their own. So when you play a Troublemaker, you play a Troublemaker face down. So your opponent doesn't know what it's going to be. They just know there's trouble that will soon be coming. While that Troublemaker is face down, your opponent can't look at it, and it doesn't have any effect on the game yet. It's kind of like a warning to your opponent that something is going to happen here, and you just don't know what, so you better prepare. The turn after you play a Troublemaker, you get to flip it up. 
And at that point, while that troublemaker is face up, your opponent cannot score points at that problem for confronting that problem until the troublemaker is dealt with and goes away. And they have to directly confront, directly challenge that troublemaker then on their turn before they play any other cards. Mm -hmm. So that means that one turn where you're giving them warning is basically their only chance to set up for it. And every turn after that that they don't try to challenge the troublemaker is a wasted turn for scoring points at that problem. Mm, Okay. If I do remember right, um, uh, there's also another kind of troublemaker card, which is the one with Discord or Nightmare Moon. What was it called again? Um, Villains. Yeah. Villains. Now, villains are especially powerful. So you think of, you know, the characters in the show that have definitely caused the most trouble for any of the main characters. And it's the big villains. It's Queen Chrysalis. It's Nightmare Moon. It's, you know, Discord, who will be coming as a villain in a later set. Uh, and villains are unique because when a villain flips face up, they frighten all friends at that problem. Not just your opponents, but yours as well. So when a friend is frightened, it basically has no effect. It doesn't have any power. It's turned face down, and it costs you resources to turn that friend face up again. So this is a very, very popular strategy. If your opponent is playing a lot of friends to one problem, you can play a troublemaker there. And your opponent might think, oh, it's no big deal. Oh. I'll, be able to con- I'll be able to challenge that troublemaker. Then you flip it face up. It's a villain, and you've just wiped out their friends for several turns while they spend tokens to turn them face up again. Oh, my. That's not fun. It's not. And the thing that makes villains very challenging is it stops both players from scoring points at that problem. So when you challenge a troublemaker, you're doing so before you play other cards on your turn, and you're hoping to get rid of that troublemaker through a face-off. Face-offs are the key mechanic of the game. You're adding up the power of all characters you have that are involved, so that would be your main character and your friends, and you're comparing it against the power of whatever your opponent is using. If it's you versus your opponent on one problem, it's your characters versus the opponent's characters. If it's you versus a troublemaker, it's the troublemaker's power versus the power of your friends at that problem. Mm -hmm. Um, Troublemakers have a point value associated with them, though, so that's why they're dangerous. You can play a troublemaker and shut down your opponent very early in the game. But if you play a troublemaker later, after your opponent already has many friends on the field, it's very possible your opponent will just be able to beat them in about a turn, and you've just fed your opponent extra points, bringing them closer to winning the game. Oh, okay, okay. Villains mean that neither player can confront that problem while that villain remains face up, and usually they have very debilitating effects when you try to challenge them. If you lose a face-off to a troublemaker, villain or not, you have to send one of your friends back to your home location. So again, Mm -hmm. making you spend more time to eventually be able to beat that villain uh, or to to beat that troublemaker. However, unlike regular troublemakers, you can challenge your own villains since they're also stopping you from confronting that problem. That means if you know to prepare for this, if you leave your friends away from that problem – then flip over the villain, and then move your friends and your main character over there, you can score your own points off of the villain saying, I was prepared to deal with this. <laughs> Yay, like Twilight. She That's was right. For this. Yep. Okay, uh, wow, that that is a cool strategy. Uh, really in-depth, really in-depth. It is, and it's the source of biggest confusion for most players, I think. Um, mm. So if you have questions about Troublemakers, um, or for that matter, any other aspect of the rule, uh, there are several places I would recommend that you to go uh, for, for new players. The Facebook Rules Group is usually pretty good about answering questions. Uh, the subreddit that we're going to link here as well is uh, mm. also great, especially as an introduction for new players as well, or questions about decks. But you can also just send me a message on my Deviant art as well. Um, I don't do a lot of individual art currently, uh, but I do make journal posts. So you can either respond to a journal post, or you can just send me a private message, and I'll be more than happy to clarify any rules questions for you. You know, GP, you you should really start your own Tumblr page. That that would be much more cooler and easier for other people. It probably would, and I'll take your advice, I think. Yay. So uh, we've been talking about scoring points and Um, problems. So what about problem decks or problem cards? 
So let's talk about those for a moment. So problem cards are cards that are different than all other cards, and it's very obvious when you first look at them, because unlike other cards which are printed vertically, problem cards are printed horizontally, and they have numbers on each side of them. The numbers that have colors associated with them are how you're going to read your problem, and that's where the text will be facing as well. Uh, The number on the other side is what your opponent needs to confront that problem. So in that way... Each of you is capable of confronting the same problem. You just need to go about it in different ways. Uh, for you to confront your own problem, you need power of one particular color and power of another color. Uh, for your opponent to do it, they need more power than you do, but it can be of any color they choose. So that means that you are always capable of confronting your opponent's problem no matter what color you're playing in your deck. Mm. Okay? Huh. Uh Problems have a point value listed with them. When you confront a problem, that is, you have characters at that problem at the end of your turn that meet the color and power requirements of that problem, when you confront a problem, you automatically score one point. In addition, if you were the first person to confront that problem, you score points equal to that problem's bonus value. It's listed right there on the card. And the bonus value of a problem is usually between one and three points. That means that if you confront a problem that has a bonus value of one point and you're the first one to do so, you're going to get one point automatically for confronting a problem and a second point for scoring the bonus. Mm. Seems simple enough. So basically we need to gain 15 points to win? That's exactly right. And you can do that by beating troublemakers, by playing a few cards which are going to give you points, or far more commonly, just by confronting problems. Hmm, okay, it seems easy and fun. Like, I played one match with a friend via the internets and whatnot, and I had a fun time just derping around. It's a really neat game, and there's a lot of different ways to go about it, like I said. You can focus on just trying to score points on uh, problems as fast as possible by playing, you know, a deck that plays a lot of cheap friends. Or you can focus on keeping your opponent from solving the problem and just slowly gaining one point a turn. Mm -hmm. This is something that's very unique about this game. As long as you continue to meet the requirements of a problem, you continue to score that basic one point every turn. So once you score a problem, your friends remain there until your opponent can also meet the requirements of that problem. As long as they ignore you and just let you sit there, you keep earning a single point every single turn. So it's very dangerous to just leave your opponent alone. It encourages you to work together to finally solve a problem instead of just confronting it. And when you... Sorry, go ahead. So if I get this right, if I confront a problem, just confronting it, it gains me a point, right? That's correct. But the problem also stays there. It doesn't go away. So if I just confront the problem, I gain a point for every 15 turns. So that's about it, right? Right. That's easy enough. Plus the bonus value the first time you do it. However, Uh if your opponent also is capable of confronting the problem then you have what's called a face-off. A face-off, like we explained before, is you're adding your total power against your opponent's total power, and then you each flip over the top card of your deck and add that card's power to your total. Mm. That's why all other cards have power listed on them, even even though they're not going to help you beat the power requirements of a problem. It's for face-offs. When you win a face-off at a problem you score points equal to that problem's bonus a second time. So if you scored the problem the first time, if you confronted it the first time and you got the bonus value, and then you win the face-off at that problem a few turns later, you'll get that bonus value again. It's only after you have a problem face-off that that problem finally goes away, changes to a new one, and all characters of that problem go back home, to the home location of a player. Hmm, So, So... This is fitting with the theme of you can't do this on your own. You need people to help you finally solve this problem, and then you can go tackle something else. Mm, That's very interesting for a kind of quote-unquote simple card game. Mm -hmm. I am really interested and want to play this card game right now. You definitely should. I've got extra decks for you. (laughs) Yay! So, okay, um, talking about me wanting to play and me wanting to get these games. Uh, Is Crazy Squirrel selling them online? That's a good question. 
Uh, we do have an online website where you can go to buy individual cards, and we may put some sealed product up there as well. However, currently, we're not doing shipping. It may be something that would change in the future, and I don't mean relation shipping. I mean <laughs> actual shipping of product. Mm-hmm. Um, However, you can always go online if you want to see how much cards are selling for. Uh, our cards are about on average of what you'd find for prices on uh, other uh, card stores or other online retailers. So it's a great way if you say, I want to pick up three copies of this card. I wonder how much it goes for. Check out our website. Send me a message as well if you know you'd like to buy a deck or some other product, especially if you're within the United States. No offense to people outside the United States, but shipping Aww. is cheaper within the country. Um mm-hmm. It's something we may be able to work out in the future. Okay, cool, cool. Because, well, as for me personally who lives in a country that doesn't have this card game, really sad, um, I would have to look for other options, which is international shipping. So, yay. Sure, that's fine. And you can always buy directly from Enterplay's store, but it's oftentimes more expensive. I'll also tell players this. This is something you might not think about. Your friendly local game store, if you have one, wants to sell you product because they want to be a successful business and they want to allow you to come in and play there. They want you to have fun with these games. The best thing you can do to help establish a local game store in your community or to continue to support one is to go shop there. Even if things are a little bit more expensive because they have to run a brick and mortar store, they have to pay for electricity and they have to pay for rent and online retailers don't, supporting the store by paying maybe an extra dollar or so helps give you a place to play and helps I, uh, helps there be a place for local players to gather and helps you meet other people interested in the game. So support your friendly local game store and try and buy local if you can. Mm, that's true, that's true. What Essentially what's happening is you find friends to play with and not only ponies, it could be Magic or it could be Yu-Gi-Oh! or it could even be Vanguard. As or it could as... be board games. It, mm, could be that, any, it, it could be a n- number of hobbies you may not have even known you were interested in. But mm-hmm. as long as there's a place for you to go there and play, you should. Yeah, I mean, it's no, it's all fun and dandy to buy the card games and to buy a pack of boosters and sniff the booster pack. Oh, <laughs> oh yes. That's so nice. But it's, it's all fun and good, but if you don't have anyone to share it with, it's no point, really. Right. And the easiest way uh, to make sure there is someone to share it with is to uh, try and find a local game store and to continue to support them. Oh, so that's true, that's true. So uh, I think we're almost close to the end here. But I sure. need to ask this one. I need to ask this one. I've noticed that in the Twilight Booster, or sorry, in the Twilight Starter, you have um, Twilight and AJ. So that's purple and orange. Correct. And in the Rainbow is... Blue and um, pur- blue and white was it? Blue and white. That's yeah, correct. Okay. I always get confused by rarities. Mean it's for purple. That's fine. So it's blue and white, and pinky is going to be pink. Pink well, and pinky. well, pinky is a little bit different because uh, pinky and Fluttershy came in a two-player starter. That means mm-hmm. that there's two fully completed decks in there. And unlike the other individual theme decks, which include two main characters, each of those decks only has one. So Pinky's deck is just Pinky, and Fluttershy's deck is just Fluttershy. However, they are still playing different colors. So Fluttershy Mm. is playing with yellow and orange, and Pinky is playing with pink and white. Mm. Uh, There's also theme decks now, though, for Celestia and Luna. So Celestia plays yellow and white and uses cards from Canterlot Knights, and Luna plays purple and blue and uses cards from Canterlot Knights. For those of you who are excited about two-player starter sets, uh, who are looking to, you know, introduce a friend to the game or to have two decks so that you can, you know, teach someone else and have everything you need to play, there's another set that will be coming out later this summer that will feature some very interesting main characters, DJ Pony uh, in pink. And Mod Pie in orange. Yes! Yes! Oh my god. Yes! Ah, hi! Okay, so my original question was, is the game available where you can create your own colors? Where, for example, if I want to ship Applejack and Rarity, could I do that? Yes. You can, oh. you can, you can do your one true shipping if you really want to. 
That's that's completely fine. Uh, and decks are going to interact in very different ways depending on which colors you have. So I've seen decks in just about every color combination out there because of the wide variety of card effects that are available. And it's only going to continue to grow. So um, probably I haven't seen the full um, problem list. but So there's a problem for white and orange then. Ah, that's a good question. Many times a problem is simply going to require that you have color or power of one color and power of any other color. So oh, even if it, yeah. even if it might not say you need three orange and two white, it might say you need three orange and two of a color other than orange or four white and three of a color other than white. So you can choose what that other color is. Sometimes you'll have problems that will say, yes, you need these two specific colors. You need four yellow and three pink, and you absolutely must have this. But more often than not, you'll find a problem that'll say one of one color and one of a different color. Mm, okay, so basically you can mod your deck to work that way. Ah, okay. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. So that's really, really fun. Wow, um, this is interesting. Like, you think it, this this way, you can go another way. Huh, cool. That's right. So it allows players to really have a lot of diversity, uh, whereas many other games will lock you into a particular clan like you're talking about. You can mm-hmm. mix and match in this game, and that's really, really nice. Mm, and basically, since everyone is playing with themselves, essentially, so you can just tweak out a combo to make it work. That's right. That's right. You can find the card effects that you like best and find interesting ways they interact that other players might not have seen and put it together into a deck. I'll give you an example of how I ended up doing this myself. I built uh, a couple of different decks uh, since I've been working with this game. Uh, Some of them are very competitive and are based off of some of the top performing decks. Others are just fun card interactions that I found. And one of them is a card named Blossomforth. If you're familiar with Blossomforth, she was the one that was a little bit too flexible when Rainbow Dash was preparing everyone for uh, uh, her in Hurricane Fluttershy. Um, Blossomforth has an effect that if you flip over a friend in a face-off involving her, normally that friend would go on the bottom of your deck, but you can instead send Blossomforth to your discard pile and pay some action tokens to put that friend into play instead. So it allows you to uh, spend possibly less than what that friend would normally cost. It also ignores the color requirement of that friend. So I've built a deck that I like to call Cheaty Forth, uh, bl- based off of a card called Cheaty Face uh, from Magic, which was kind of a goofy card. Um, mm-hmm. But the idea is it uses Blossom Forth and a lot of other cards that are in colors way outside of what your deck is playing. You'd never be able to meet the requirements, and the cards are really expensive to play with the resources in the game, uh, the action tokens. You need like six or something for the friends. They're really, really costly. But what it does is it allows you to manipulate your deck to put those cards either from your hand on top of the deck, flip them over in a face-off, retire Blossom Forth, put her into your discard pile, put those friends into play instead, and then use another card to return Blossom Forth to your hand and do this turn after turn after turn. So you're just cheating out all these big friends that you'd normally never be able to play. Oh god, that, that is so awesome. Mm. It's just it's just a funny strategy. It's not super competitive, but it plays well enough on its own, and that's really what it comes down to. Just find something you like that's fun and make it as competitive as you want. I could mm. change this deck to function much better, but I, and I already have. I've gone through several revisions of it, but it's fun as as it is. There's mm. a few things I want to talk about really quickly if I can. Right. Uh, this would just be advice to new players. Uh, there's a great article that was posted on uh, one of the uh, sites, I think it's uh, Pony Card, uh, that uh, talks about some of the top mistakes that new players are going to make. And I would just like to encourage anyone who's getting into this game or is excited to keep a few of these things in mind when you're playing the game. Number one, um, don't Play friends just because you can. Remember that as long as you meet the requirements of a problem, um, you continue to score a point there every turn. Having more than what you need at a problem isn't going to gain you anything extra unless you're having a face-off. So keep your friends in your hand or play them to a different problem instead to try and meet that one too so that you can score points faster. That way you don't run out of options if a villain pops up and suddenly all your friends are frightened. 
Troublemakers are great early in the game, and they can be very powerful as villains later in the game, frightening all of your opponent's friends. But don't play Troublemakers just because you can. Oftentimes, you'll play a Troublemaker, your opponent will be easily able to beat it, and all you did was give your opponent extra points. So think about where is a good place to play a Troublemaker, where can it do the most damage, where can it have the most of an effect on the game. Mm, okay. Um, don't draw cards just because you don't have something you can play right then and there. Uh MLP is unique in that it allows you to spend one of your resources, one of your action tokens, to draw a card during your main phase of the game. And very few games allow you to do that. Uh, this means that a lot of players will be sitting there thinking, uh, I can't play anything right now. I'll spend all my action tokens to draw a bunch of cards and hope that I have something to play. There's no reason to do that. Uh, there's a time and a place for spending action tokens to draw cards, and it's usually when you're looking for an answer to something so that you can keep the game going. Mm. Uh, but panic drawing, as it's called, is usually a bad strategy. Just wait, and things will eventually come to you. Uh, don't waste all your resources just filling up your hand. And the last thing I want to talk about is pacing. Pacing in this game is very important because of how the point scoring strategy works. Um, when a problem changes, the new problem flips up and that bonus can be scored. So even though you might be able to trigger face-offs at one or more problems on your turn uh, and score many, many points, you're setting your opponent up to score points on fresh problems. And you can often turn an entire game around that way um, and give your opponent, who may have been at a huge disadvantage, an easy win. I actually ended up doing this recently in a game with one of the players we were demonstrating for where I had the ability to win the game with the uh, cheaty fourth deck, the Blossom fourth deck that I had built, uh, but I decided I wanted to try and show him the interactions that I had. So <laughs> I just played a regular friend instead and said, he's many points behind me, it'll be okay, no problem. Well, he had been locked out of a particular color because he didn't have the cards he needed. He drew that card that he needed at the start of his turn. It allowed him to play even more cards and to score eight out of a maximum 15 points in a single turn and completely win the game. <laughs> wow. So pacing, so, uh, pacing can be important because you can have huge turns like that and you don't want to set your opponent up for that. Try to go to about 10 points or so before you fully commit to both problems because that's about what you'll need. Mm, oh, okay. Wow. That is awesome. That, those are good advice for any beginner. I wish I could say I wrote that advice. I didn't. That was an article that was on Ponyhead and there's more tips and tricks in there as well. We'll post a link to that as well. Awesome. 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 So, before we go, you, you mentioned this to me uh, in a while back and also on the show where you said that the developer for the card game also did quote-unquote Magic the Gathering and you also said that there's a card called um, Black Lotus and there's also a similar version in the Pony game. Ah, yes. Yeah, uh, so, is, so the question here is, is there any card out there that's similar to other card games or even pop culture reference? You know, that's a great question. I wish I was more familiar with other card games so I could answer that question for you. I am familiar with most of the magic references that are out there, uh, so those I can spot. However, um, there are plenty of references to things that are designed uh, by the fandom, actually, and created. And I'll give you some great examples of this. Uh, Lyra has a card in Premiere, and the flavor text at the bottom of Lyra's card talks about her uh, being the most interested to hear about uh, Twilight Sparkle's journey through the magic mirror. Uh, implying that she wants to hear about humans. Go figure. <laughs> and right. there's cards, uh, there's another card of just a regular friend, uh, who, uh, the flavor text, the quote at the bottom is, uh, I don't know about you, but I need a lot more than a glass of orange juice to get me going in the morning. And it's by Barry Punch, who everyone <laughs> established to be the town drunk. So <laughs> go figure. It's it's really fun to see those references and to see other references to other magic cards. Uh, there's a card called Pie Family Rock Farm that talks about them not minding the wind howling through their mine as they continue to mine the rock. And it's obviously a reference to the card Howling Mine from Magic the Gathering. And it's it's just fun to see uh, those those little references, not just to other card games, but to the show as well, to things the fandom has developed. And it's it's really, really cool. 
Mm, and I, I also believe that there's a critter card in the yellow, which is a weasel, and the flavor text is there's a lo- there's a weasel on your face. Sometimes. Oh, right, right. There's a, there's an event card that uh, features um, some some critters attacking. Um, I think I think it's called like furry free for all or something along those lines. They're they're chasing after this one pony, and the flavor text is by Cheese Sandwich, and it says, "Hey." You've got weasels on your face, which is a reference to Weird Al's song Albuquerque. So that's that's just fun to see. That is awesome. Seriously, I, I think that Enterplay was the right choice when Hasbro told them to make the card game because I could not see Magic doing this. Sure, sure. Magic has far more of a serious tone to it. There are instances of jokes you can find, but they're few and far between, whereas MLP has a lot of that great humor that carries over from the show and references pop culture, just like the show does. So mm-hmm, it's mm-hmm. neat. To, it's really, really neat to see that. I believe there's actually an individual, the one who uh, posts a lot of the updates about the card game on Equestria Daily, who is involved in making sure that uh, the flavor of the show and the fandom uh, translates over into the card game itself. I wish I could remember the individual's name. I apologize, whoever you are, uh, but I I think there's kind of a, a community uh, liaison, as it were. Ah, that, that that is awesome. That is awesome. Wow. And like, like I said before, uh, I think we already asked all the questions that I could think of right now, and any more questions from this point on will be just redundant. Yep. I think we've covered just about everything we need to. If you have any other questions about the card game, uh, like I said, there's several different ways you can reach me. Uh, I may end up starting a Tumblr here soon at Norman's uh, request, uh, but for now, you can definitely reach me on my DeviantArt. I'd be more than happy to answer questions. Uh, if you have uh, rules questions in general or are just interested in getting started in the game, check out some of those groups we provide for you. We're more than happy to introduce new players. Awesome, awesome. I'll be sure to link everything in the show notes. So, once again, GP, thank you for coming on and thank you for sharing your stories with us and thank you for hyping me up with, for this card game because, woo, this is fun. Well, I'm glad and I really appreciate you having me on the show. This is a great way to uh, let people know about an awesome game that's out there that they might not otherwise have tried and it's been a great experience with both of you, so thank you very much. Awesome, awesome. So, anywho, um, GP, where can they find you? Uh, like I said, you'll be able to find me at grandpawspony at gmail.com or on my DeviantArt or on a soon-to-be Tumblr, which will be linked there later, and also through the groups we provided. Oh, cool. I'll add in the show notes. I can't imagine me doing this, like, merging two things I like into one. I like card games and I like doing this show and merging them together. Would you say the fun has been doubled? Huzzah! Yes, <laughs> indeedy. <laughs> So, anywho, um, let's move on to the next topic. And next topic sure. is shoutouts. My first shoutout goes to you, Grandpa's. You've been an awesome guest, and thank you for coming on and talking about the card games and all of your experiences. Oh, not a problem. Thank you so much for having me again. And thank you, Rom. Thank you for being there. Like You're still there, and you need to talk. I'm still here. I'm just taking notes, because I have never been involved in any card games, and this is really educational. Oh, that's good. I'm glad I've got you interested. And again, there was a lot of things that we talked about today that may have been very confusing for players who have not participated in a collectible card game before. Don't worry about it. It is easy enough to learn. Uh, You Mm -hmm. don't need to go be a competitive player right at the beginning. You can start small, and everyone will be willing to teach you. Again, you know, this is all about love and tolerate. We are going to help you have fun with this game no matter how you want to do it. True that, true that. And it doesn't mean for ponies also, it works for every other card game. I recently played Magic a few months ago, and the community around it has been really helpful. That's good to hear. And other games too, you know, any, find a group of people who share a similar interest, and they'll usually be happy to help you get introduced to there, because they want to share what they enjoy, and they want other people to enjoy it too. True that, true that. And Rom, any shout outs? Shoutouts to everyone who's listening. Thank you all for so much for sticking around. Shout out to you, Norm, for help for allowing me to be on the show. And shout out to my mother. Hi, mom. <laughs> awesome. And what about you, GP? 
A uh, few shout-outs I'd like to give anyone in the online community who's involved in uh, the My Little Pony collectible card game. You guys are awesome. You've been fantastic in helping this game continue to grow and succeed. Uh, to uh, everyone at Enterplay, who's done a great job in uh, helping this game pick up and uh, really take off. Uh, I'd also like to give a shout-out to Silver Quill, who put me in contact with both of you uh, in the first place. Uh, he, mm-hmm. uh, I, I had the chance to meet him and befriend him at BabsCon, and we've continued to uh, talk and interact since then, and he's been a great individual, uh, really instrumental in encouraging me to get involved in the Brona community, and I'm very, very happy that he has. So, Silver, thank you so much. Mm-hmm. Ooh. I shout out to him too because he has been awesome and without him I would have been in contact with you and wow to think that my life would not have been enlightened without card games <laughs> I'm glad I could fill that empty spot <laughs> yay empty spot of card games <laughs> Pony's card game to be exact but yes it- I'd also like to give one last shout out just to all the gamers that we have there at Crazy Squirrel. You guys are all fantastic. You continue to make me excited to support our uh, our local gaming and to uh, local game stores everywhere for doing an awesome job. It's not the most glamorous profession. It's not the most uh, uh, valuable uh, profession either. But man, is it fun! So you guys all do great work. Yeah, true that, true that. And you know what, GP? One day you can collect all those stories and make your own web series like Spoonie. <laughs> Hey, it'd be pretty fun. Maybe I might be able to. Yeah. So anyway, um, if you have any questions, concerns, or suggestions for the show, you can contact us at show at gmail.com. And if you would like to email us personally, well, um, emails are in the description. You can also reach us on Twitter. The show's Twitter account is at the MBS show. Sweetie Bot will... Hmm, I wonder what she will do in this episode. James is not here. So she'll do stuff, I guess. You could also reach me at Norman Sanzo. I usually tweet things about food, toys, and, well, card games. It seems, yeah, card games. I need to tweet about card games. Mental note, yes. And what about you, Rom? They can find me at twitter.com slash showmewall, the Z69. I don't usually post, but I do hang out on Twitter a lot, looking at my other followings. Awesome, awesome. And also, please subscribe and read us on iTunes, YouTube, and Stitch Radio, and also like our Facebook page. You can also... Uh, catch us on PonyvilleLive.com. Links will be provided in the show notes. I have been Norman Sanzo. I am Romuald. I am Grand Paws. And you have activated my trap card. We'll see you guys next week. Does that work? No? Yes? It's fine, it's fine. I was, I think, I, was, I had the thought that you would go for a Yu-Gi-Oh! reference, but that works too. Yeah, it is a Yu-Gi-Oh! reference. Oh. Now it is. Damn it, how did I miss that episode? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe I not one to look past all the years they slave away, but I'm far from where I'll be someday. They'll find me free from them at last, picking up pieces of me, pieces of me. But my head's down on the pavement, wondering where the years went, all the time I spent under rice of contempt My mind's still a crutch as I stand at the edge of what's ahead I'm frozen instead I might be chasing pipe dreams, at least I'm chasing something more than shadows on the city street They always said that I was green, that I Shadows on the city street They'll take back everything I'm not one to look past All the times I've been outcast But someday I know that they'll find me Free from them at last Picking up pieces of me Pieces of me myself together yeah but my head's down on the pavement wondering where the years went all the time I spent 
under eyes full of contempt. My mind still a crutch as I stand at the edge of what's ahead. I'm frozen instead. I might be chasing pipe dreams. At least I'm chasing something more than shadows on the city street. They always said that I was green. That I won't amount to anything more than shadows on the city street. They'll take back everything. I might be chasing. I might be chasing. I might be chasing. I might be chasing, I might be chasing pipe dreams, at least I'm chasing something more than shadows on the city street. They always said that I was green, that I won't amount to anything more than shadows on the city street. They'll take back everything. Our guest for this week is an ML, ML, <coughs> sorry, three, two, one. Our guest for this week is an MLP CCG judge, and wow, I'm dropping this really hard. You're fine. I'm trying to think of how to introduce you. Give me a second. Brain processing. Okay, sure, that's me. fine. Do it like the Academy Awards. Uh-huh. I got no idea how they do that. Uh, they they have an orchestra that plays you <laughs> off. <laughs> Uh, anywho, um, three, two.